So hello, my name is Erin Moran and I am the Clinic Partnership Manager here at the MAVEN Project. Thank you all for joining us today for COPD, Understanding the New Gold Guidelines with Dr. Daniel Ray. Hello, everybody. So um, I'm going over the gold guidelines. Let's see, um, it's a expert panel empowered by the WHO to create um, uh, evidence-based guidelines for treatment of uh, COPD. So there have been some uh, recent changes, so I wanted to uh, review those for uh, everybody. So um, I have no uh, conflict of interest. Uh, and these are the points that I wanted to cover today. Um, one was the role of spirometry in the diagnosis of COPD, how to classify your patients in these gold treatment groups, um, and then the treatments based on those groupings, uh, what the changing role of inhaled cortical steroids are in the treatment of COPD, who needs oxygen at home, what are some adjuvant therapies, and then treatment of exacerbation. So, Hopefully we'll get through all that and then I can love to take questions because those are the most fun. Um, like other uh, expert panels, they tend to review things uh, and uh, base the quality of the evidence on uh, the, uh, the randomized controlled trials. Uh, if the trials are large and generalizable, then it's uh, considered a, a category A. And then if trials are more limited, or there's only one trial available, uh, then it's given a category B. Everything else is just kind of people's opinion. Um, so to establish a diagnosis of COP, it's actually relatively straightforward. You need either symptoms and uh, obstruction on spirometry or risk factors and obstruction on spirometry. So the symptoms of correction risk factors being smoke exposure or occupational exposure or uh, exposure to balloon uh, and host factors. Uh, the costs can be intermittent uh, and non-productive or they can be productive. Wheezing occurs, but not always. Um, so, and then sputum can be any pattern. So daily uh, cough productive sputum, intermittent sputum, um, and then uh, in terms of risk factors, mostly those would be host factors. So history of um, family, history of uh, COPD, somebody that has already has congenital abnormalities of the lung, <clears throat> and then tobacco smoke exposure. Uh, we're seeing more and more of uh, COPD in uh, people exposed to cooking fuels, uh, fumes, uh, gases in the house, uh, and then, of course, occupational exposures. So those are uh, the main risk factors that we look for if uh, uh, when we consider doing spirometry. There are not many things that uh, mimic COPD. Um, so the differential the diagnosis is relatively limited, uh, asthma being the, the primary one where we sometimes have a trouble differentiating between asthma and COPD. And in fact, sometimes we can't. Uh, you have lots of smokers that have uh, reactive airway disease and behave more like they have asthma than uh, COPD. Uh, and we just call that um, asthma COPD overlap. Uh, just uh, uh, the short answer to how do we treat those patients? Will we treat them uh, more towards how they behave. So if they behave more like asthma, we treat them like they have asthma. If they behave more like they have COPD, then we treat them as if they have COPD, even though they have features of the other disease. Um, and then you can see the symptoms of that are suggestive of COPD is that it's occurring later in life, it's slowly progressive, and then obviously they'll have this history of smoke exposure or other exposures. Uh, whereas asthma tends to be associated with allergies occurring earlier in life. Uh, you'll have nocturnal symptoms, uh, uh, allergic symptoms, uh, and then strong family history of asthma. And um, you'll tend to see asthma more in obese uh, patients, and you won't see as many obese patients uh, with COPD. Uh, other things that can obviously cause shortness of breath that you might uh, say that you might see in a smoker would be uh, heart failure and or uh, bronchiectasis. So somebody may have a persistent cough 
productive of mucus on a daily basis and have some obstruction on spirometry, but uh, uh, when the chest x-ray or CT is done, you'll see evidence of this bronchial dilation, thickening of the walls, uh, mucus plugging uh, that's characteristic of bronchiectasis. Um, these other diseases are uh, much less likely to look like COPD, but if you have somebody coming from an area where it's endemic, uh, it would be uh, useful to consider that diagnosis. So spirometry, we said, is necessary for the diagnosis. You have to have obstruction on spirometry, but it's also useful in uh, establishing prognosis for the patient. Uh, and we'll go over that in just a minute. Uh, and then you can use spirometry to follow up uh, a therapeutic change or if there's a sudden change in the patient's symptoms or uh, it's often worthwhile doing to compare with previous tests. Um, spirometry is really hard. It is, <laughs> and it uh, can be misinterpreted. Um, you have to be sure that the person that's administering the spirometry really understands what they're doing and um, works with the patient to get a good test. Um, the, um, it, a lot of people have trouble following the instructions. You often have to demonstrate it yourself several times to get the patient to do it right. Uh, and even uh, after coaching the patient, uh, sometimes you just can't obtain a, a valid spirometry. So um, it's important not to try to interpret uh, a questionable spirometry value uh, or base your treatment on that. Um, so you want a patient to take a deep breath in and immediately exhale all the way out and keep exhaling uh, until they can't exhale anymore. Um, the, uh, you don't want them taking their breath and then holding it and thinking for a while and then blowing out. We see that a lot. Um, you want to see that they plateau uh, before you they stop. Um, and then um, you want to be able that they can repeat this three times with their FEV1 with being within 5%, um, with, so not very much variation uh, between uh, three consecutive tests or three tests out of six. Um, uh, so that you can make an accurate determination. Um, the other things to know is if you're using a bronchodilator to look for uh, airway reactivity, you need to wait uh, 10 minutes before you repeat the spirometry. That's sometimes hard to do in a, uh, an office setting where you're seeing lots of patients, but if you can have them go out and wait in the waiting area and then come back and be retested, it would be optimal. Um, the key determination to, for COPD is that they, their ratio of FEV1 to FEC is less than 0.7. So if you have that, they have obstruction. Uh, and then you can go on uh, and look at uh, their FEV1. These are examples of uh, a normal spirometry and an obstructed spirometry. Um, you can see normally when people have no obstruction, uh, they pretty much completed their exhalation at, by two or three seconds, and then they're plateaued. Whereas somebody with spirometry, <sighs> they keep blowing for many, many seconds. Um, and in fact, you can even hear this uh, on your exam. If you have them take a deep breath in, put your stethoscope on their chest and have them continue to blow out, <sighs> you can hear um, at, breath sounds uh, going on for more than five or six seconds, they, they have obstruction. Um, the, uh, I think everybody has seen this kind of a graph, uh, which is what happens to our uh, FEV1 over time. Unfortunately, like uh, so many things in our body, it, it gets worse over time, although it's very slow in somebody that's a non-smoker and doesn't have any other significant lung disease, uh, such that we have to get pretty old uh, to start to see a significant decline in lung function. Unfortunately, uh, in smokers and in particularly in susceptible smokers, um, you'll see a more rapid decline in lung function over time so that by their 
fifth, sixth, seventh decade, they've reached a point uh, decline in lung function that actually produces symptoms. So you'll start to see patients complaining of exertional dyspnea um, as, as they continue down this curve of, um, of decline uh, in their uh, lung function. The one, I tend to use this graph uh, to show patients that if, if they stop smoking, uh, say you, you've got a smoker, they're 40 years old, uh, you do spirometry, um, they have borderline obstruction in FEV1 of say 80%. Uh, you say, if you stop smoking now, uh, this decline in your lung function is going to level out and you'll only lose lung function like these other patients that uh, have not smoked. So you won't continue down this deep decline. So it's a way of extending the, their time without symptoms uh, for several decades, if possible, if you can make that early intervention. The uh, if you've got somebody, they're obstructed, their uh, ratio of FEV1 to FEC is less than 0.7. Uh, you can then look at the FEV1 uh, percent predicted uh, to categorize them in terms of their severity. So uh, mild patients, mildly obstructed patients may only have an FEV1 of 80% predicted. Um, if you get into these gold two, three, and four categories where the FEV1 um, percent predicted is less than 80%, less than 50%, less than 30%, um, these patients may be, uh, have symptoms um, uh, and um, they would qualify, for example, for pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, if they have um, um, severe obstruction, so, uh, or very severe obstruction, and their symptoms are such that they're unable to work, they would actually qualify for uh, social security disability. So it's uh, useful for prognosis, it's useful for these, uh, um, for uh, getting services for them. Um, and um, you then can use the same, uh, whatever FEV1 they have to compare uh, going forward to see if, if there's been significant changes in their lung function. But um, I guess the, the most important thing is that we don't actually treat patients now based on their uh, spirometry. We treat patients based on their symptoms um, and their uh, the frequency of their exacerbation. So it's important uh, that we uh, categorize their uh, symptoms. Um, there are a number of tools to do this. Uh, I like the this uh, Medical Research Council um, because it's so simple. Uh, um, patients with minimal uh, disease will have uh, breathlessness only with exercise. Patients with severe symptoms will have breathlessness just getting dressed, doing things around the house. And then uh, there's the gradation in between. Um, so this would, grade one and zero would be mild uh, shortness of breath. Uh, grade two, three, and four would be uh, more severe shortness of breath. There's another uh, more comprehensive uh, assessment tool called the CAT assessment. Uh, that this not only looks at shortness of breath, for example, when I walk up one flight of stairs and I'm breathless, you know, no or yes, uh, but it also uh, pulls in other factors like their cough, um, their uh, general sense of well-being, their uh, energy, et cetera. Um, so it's more of a complete uh, evaluation of the symptoms produced by COPD. This is the key slide, uh, and we'll spend some time on this, uh, because if you understand this, then you know how to approach um uh, both the diagnosis, you know, the uh, and uh, treatment of COPD. So we start with uh, a patient that we has either symptoms or uh, risk factors. Uh, we do a spirometry, and lo and behold, they're obstructed. So we've established a diagnosis of COPD. Uh, we can grade the level of obstruction uh, based on the 
FEV1 percent predicted. Uh, and then we move over to assess their symptoms and their risk uh, and their number of exacerbations uh, in order to put them in a treatment group. So this is the gold A, B, C, D uh, treatment. Um, and that's based on their symptom score and exacerbations. So for example, uh, our mild patients, group A, have minimal symptoms. So uh, maybe they have symptoms only when they're exercising and they haven't had any significant flare-ups in their disease in the past year. That would be group A and uh, our treatment would be based on that. And we'll go over that in just a minute. Uh, group B, those having uh, daily symptoms, um, they may be mild or they may be uh, moderate in severity, but they're not having exacerbations. They're not having to be treated with steroids or antibiotics uh, on a frequent basis. Group C is starting to have more exacerbations. So they're having flare ups that are needing to be treated or they've been hospitalized. And then group uh, D having uh, multiple exacerbations plus daily symptoms. Based on those groups, uh, there's an initial pharmacologic therapy that's recommended. So our mild group, ones having minimal symptoms and no exacerbations or infrequent exacerbations, then a bronchodilator is, uh, can be ordered. And this can just be a short-acting bronchodilator if they have really minimal symptoms or a, a long-acting bronchodilator. If the patient is now having um, more constant symptoms but not exacerbations, then they should be on either a LAVA or a LAMA, uh, so a long-acting beta agonist or a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Um, and as I'll show you, the evidence points more towards starting them on a LAMA than a LAVA. Uh, if the patient now is having uh, exacerbations and minimal symptoms, they should be on at least a LAMA. And then uh, our most severe group, the ones that are having daily symptoms and frequent exacerbations, they should be on a combination, lava lama uh, And then we can consider whether or not uh, they would benefit from inhaled corticosteroids. The, this is where the treatment of COPD gets really complicated. It's like, which of these inhalers do you choose? And that's going to be primarily based on um, the, your formulary. Um, compliance is inversely related to cost. If it's an expensive medicine, the patient's not gonna get it, not gonna use it or use it infrequently, uh, not as prescribed. Uh, they have to be able to afford this medicine. Um, so whatever your, the, the patient's insurance allows, uh, um, then the exact uh, type of inhaler should, uh, is not, important what is important is that it's either uh it's in the uh correct group so a long-acting beta agonist a long-acting muscarinic antagonist a combination lava llama or a combination lava llama inhaled corticosteroid um, so uh the evidence there's a a lot of this, but it, I'll, um, I'll skip to the summary because um, basically what this boils down to is that uh, long-acting beta agonists and long-acting muscarinic antagonists are the preferred uh, agent or inhaler to treat your COPD patients. Um, sorry, I've got a call from my daughter coming in. Um, um, excuse me, Dr. Ray. Yeah. There are a few questions in the chat. Do you mind if I interrupt? Yeah, let's, let's answer those. Okay. Okay, perfect. There are three here. The first one is just a comment. Um, the MCR Dyspina scale is a study from 1960 uh -huh. with a surprise. Um, and then the next one is, since the CAT assessment is trademarked, do we need to pay to use it? No. <laughs> so no. Okay. And then the last one, um, and we do have a raised hand is, uh, what do you do if someone can't slash doesn't slash won't um, get spirometry? Uh, you can't do anything about that. The, um, then you'll have to make your best assessment. Do that. If they have obstruction, if you're hearing wheezing and they're having 
uh, you know, obviously delayed um, exhalation when on your examination and they, they're obstructed. I mean, ideally you'd have spirometry, but if they're not going to do it, then you can't force them. Okay, thank you. And then it looks like the hands uh, were lowered, so we'll move on and I'll let you know if anything else um, comes through. Okay. Thank you. So uh, lava and llamas, basically, uh, if you've got a patient, they're having symptoms, start them on a lava or a llama, I, ideally a llama, uh, because uh, there's, in comparison with llamas, the llamas have uh, fewer exacerbations and there's a... Um, uh, an improvement in uh, or fewer hospitalizations, although that's uh, evidence grade B. Um, and then if they're uh, having symptoms on a single agent, so you started a lab, uh, llama, for example, and the patient is still symptomatic, go ahead and uh, place on on a combination uh, lava llama. Um, and then Obviously, inhaled bronchodilators are better than oral bronchodilators, and we're not using theophylline anymore. So um, the, the main thing to understand is that uh, long-acting beta agonists, long-acting mescronic antagonists are the, are the principal inhaler we're using to treat uh, COPD. We can, as the patient becomes more symptomatic, we step that up uh, to combination, lava llama, and then as we said, we'll investigate now what the, the role of inhaled corticosteroids is. So um, there's evidence that um, if you add an inhaled corticosteroid with a long-acting beta agonist in patients with moderately severe COPD um, and uh, having frequent exacerbations, that they do better. Um, if you trade that off with this uh, increased risk of pneumonia in patients that are on an inhaled corticosteroid. So that's why we try not to use inhaled corticosteroids in everybody. Uh, we uh, leave it out for those that are having um, uh, severe symptoms and recurrent exacerbations. And then finally, this uh, triple combination has been shown to do uh, improve symptoms, health status, reduces exacerbations, uh, compared to any of these other uh, combinations or monotherapy. Um, and then uh, we try not, obviously we try to avoid long-term oral glucocorticoids, but there are other anti-inflammatories. I'll mention these. Um, it's probably, these would be prescribed by the pulmonologist and I wouldn't necessarily recommend using them in the primary care clinic. However, your patient may come to you on these, and then obviously they can be continued. Um, so that would include the um, PDE4 inhibitors uh, or uh, long-term treatment with uh, azithromycin um, in our chronic bronchitic patients. Um, um, both of these have been helpful in reducing exacerbations. So what about the steroids? So, um, Yes, we should be using uh, inhaled corticosteroids to treat our COPD patients in our very severe, our group D patients, the ones that are having multiple exacerbations um, uh, and our symptoms. Uh, and then to note that those patients tend to, tend to show a response if they have an elevated eosinophil count uh, or they're one of these people that have um, asthma, in addition to COPD, or one of these overlap syndromes. Um, we should not be using inhaled corticosteroids if the patient's having frequent pneumonias or they have minimal or no eosinophils on their uh, CBC differential, or if they have a history of um, mycobacterial disease. So uh, I saw lots of patients with atypical mycobacterial infections. Uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroids tend to uh, uh, make this worse, and so we try to avoid their use. The the tough patients are the ones that are having you you are having to treat exacerbations, and their blood eosinophils are elevated, but they're not really they're not severely elevated. So this in between group, uh, if you're if they're failing combination lava llama uh, treatment, then you could consider 
uh, triple therapy. So lava llama inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, so just again, the key points, long-term uh, therapy with inhaled corticosteroids is not recommended. So we don't treat these patients like asthma. Um, you can consider use of this in combination with uh, lava. Um, if the patient is having uh, uh, its acerbations um, and uh, not pneumonia, uh, and then use of oral long-term oral corticosteroids are not really recommended. Um, and then we talked about the other anti-inflammatories you could consider using uh, if if the patient is still having exacerbations. Uh, one of the key things about uh, inhalers is that they are uh, difficult to use and it takes a lot of vigilance on our part uh, to make sure the patient knows how to use them, is using them correctly, and then it, it repeat it all over again the next time they're in clinic. Um, it's amazing how you can teach a patient to use an inhaler They'll go home and you'll see them three months later and ask them to show you how to use the inhaler and they do it wrong. Um, and these inhalers, uh, they, they require different, uh, they're, some of them are the dry powder actuated inhaler. Some of them are breath actuated. They're, uh, they, uh, each one has to, be, has to be taken individually and the, demonstrated to the patient. Uh, what I would do is I would have the patient not take the medicine the day they were coming to clinic and I would have them bring it in the inhaler and then demonstrate in front of me how they were using it so I could check their technique. Um, you wanna be sure that they're actually one, using the inhaler, they're not uh, cutting out doses because it's too expensive uh, and that they're using it correctly before you uh, prescribe yet more medicine to try to control their symptoms. Uh, the same thing we do with asthma. Other things that we can do, uh, obviously, if the patient hasn't already quit smoking, you're going to try to help them to quit smoking. And there are any number of techniques, but you have to ask the patient. You have to tell them to quit smoking. Uh, you know, I when I've done that, then I would immediately ask, are we ready? Can we do it? Can we pick a day? Um, and then adjuvant uh, treatments do help. So that would be uh, the nicotine um, gum patches um, uh, or the pharmacologic therapies, the uh, uh, buprofen, the valve uh, recycling, I, that what used to be Chantex is now the generic, the valerin acyclin. Um, and then uh, most importantly is that either they follow up with you or they follow up with somebody just to keep prompting them to quit. Um, and as you probably already experienced, your patients will quit and they'll start again, they'll quit and they'll start again. Just uh, keep at it. Uh, the majority of people that had started smoking have already quit. So um, your patient might be one of those that quits and that will um, be the most important thing in terms of reducing that progressive decline in lung function that uh, is will continue if there's smoke. Vaccinations, obviously, uh, if your patient will allow it, uh, vaccines uh, to prevent pneumonia, uh, COVID, um, to minimize the effects of these, um, you know, flu vaccine, obviously. Um, and then uh, pulmonary rehab. Uh, if you have access to pulmonary rehab, you should be using it for those patients with uh, moderate severe obstruction on their uh, on their uh, spirometry. The uh, it improves the general health status of the patient, their exercise tolerance, and sense of well-being. You can, uh, if they haven't already done rehab, you when they go home from the hospital after an exacerbation, you can enroll them. Uh, there's some evidence that that uh, prevents rehospitalization. Uh, then oxygen. Obviously, if the patient has chronic resting hypoxemia, uh, there is strong evidence that uh, oxygen will uh, improve their general health and reduce uh, uh, mortality. Um, but 
it is just it's resting oxygen saturation less than 88 percent so uh, what doesn't help is treating the patients that desaturate when they walk around the office or, or um, you have to run them up a set of stairs before they desaturate don't don't prescribe oxygen for those patients uh, use saturations of less than 88 percent at rest as your cutoff and the only caveat to that is the small group of patients that have right heart failure or erythrocytosis, uh, you can prescribe oxygen with saturations of less than 90%. You titrate uh, the oxygen so that their sats are greater than 90%, and then you're going to need a Medicare. It's going to require you to uh, reevaluate in, within three months. And then finally, um, uh, your patients with COPD are going to be at risk for lung cancer. Uh, so uh, low-dose CT screening for those age uh, greater than 55. This is now 20-pack years, so smoking history 20 greater than 20-pack years. And age greater than 55 qualify for these uh, screening CT scans. Um, excuse me, Dr. Ray. There mm -hmm. is um, a few questions in the chat I'd like to address. Okay. Um, so the first one is talking about the technique you just reviewed. Um, can a pharmacist check the technique? How do we as providers know the best techniques? Are spacers helpful? So um, so yes, a pharmacist can uh, check the technique. Uh, spacers nowadays, except for the uh, standard meter dose inhaler, uh, are not that helpful. For Most of the inhalers now are dry powder, uh, breath actuated. So... And, the spacers don't even fit onto it. Um, um, so you, it requires the patient, uh, you know, being able to pull in the dry powder. Um, uh, so they have to seal their lips around it and suck in. And so it's different than um, the meter dose inhaler, where the particles are initially dispersed in the in the volume of the uh, spacer. Um, so they're. Depending on the inhaler, you can use a spacer, but uh, more importantly, that the patient just do uh, show the correct technique for the given inhaler. Um, the, uh, I will add a, a small caveat to that. The um, Some patients that are uh, very severely affected, so they have FEV1s of less than a liter, um, 600 cc's, they uh, are not able to... Um, um, pull in the dry powder on a lot of these breath actuated inhalers. They need a, they need more uh, uh, inspiratory flow to generate enough flow to pull in the dry powder. So for those patients, a pump um, uh, 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 inhaler is, is uh, more useful. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, there are two more questions. Um, so the next question is. Can you talk a bit more about what happens in pulmonary rehab? Would you oh. be able to give patients an idea of what to expect? Yeah. So the, um, it's a mostly a program of exercises um, uh, under supervision of the nurse. Um, so uh, that's both lightweights, uh, aerobic exercises, treadmill, stationary bikes, things like that. Um, there is... Uh, an educational component. They talk about uh, managing their COPD, how, how to use in the inhalers, when to call the doctor. Um, and uh, if the patient is uh, desaturating during exercise, the nurses will apply oxygen so that um, it tends to improve the uh, effect of the exercise. Um, so it's, it's mostly just uh, the patient learns that they can do more uh, by themselves, you know, as they start with the nurse and uh, teach them, for example, um, um, purse slip breathing. Uh, so when they get into a situation where they're suddenly short of breath, they can uh, relax and get out of that situation. So that's uh, an important technique that they learn and which you can actually teach your patient in the office. Obviously, that's the the deep breath in, blowing out uh, through pursed lips, uh, that a uh, little bit of positive pressure uh, tends to open up the airways, but more importantly, it kind of gives the way for a patient to begin to relax um, so that they don't, they don't feel like they're 
uh, unable to take a breath. Um, yeah, so that's what I would describe for your patient with uh, for pulmonary rehab. I'm sorry. And then there's another question. Oops, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Um, the next question is, if a patient is on a triple inhaler and is getting repeated pneumonia, and you would like to um, DC the ICS, what mm -hmm. do you consider the step down to be? Is there a taper needed for the ICS component? Uh, no, there should not be a taper needed. Um, the um, and it would just be a they would you would just move them back to a combination lava llama, um, um, whatever is on their formulary. Um, the that's a difficult one. Yeah, that's really difficult. But uh, but you should do that. Uh, if they're getting pneumonias, then the inhaled corticosteroids is probably uh, contributing in part to that, and um, they'll do better without it. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't use a short burst of oral corticosteroids uh, to treat an exacerbation. It just means that long-term, they shouldn't be on inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, any other questions? No. Um, yes, there is some questions in um, the Q&A. Would you like to address them now or do you want to get through the presentation? Uh, no, no, let's address them now. Okay, perfect. Um, so this next question is, I frequently have adult patients report asthma because they interchange COPD and asthma, usually patients who are weak historians. Oftentimes, they have been off medications for some time, and they get to me, so I am starting medications. Speometry is not always available in my clinic. It usually has to be scheduled. Do you suggest holding off on initiating the ICS until speometry can be performed, since we want to avoid standalone LABA in asthmatic patients? I sometimes feel pressured to start dual therapy from the start, or um, if I'm having to make clinical judgment. And then there's just one more comment, clarification. I sometimes feel pressured to start dual therapy from the start if having to use clinical judgment. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because you want your, your patients coming to you, they've got lots of symptoms. You want them uh, to feel better right away because then they're much more likely to trust you and to come back and to follow your instructions, et cetera. So I totally understand that. Um, and, you know, I, I've been there. I do it. The uh, I often start patients on a lot of therapy up front just to get them under control and then uh, dial it back. So I think that's within the your the realm of clin good clinical judgment. I would do that. Um, but w with the idea in mind that uh, if when the patient comes back and you've it's becoming clear to you that they have COPD and not asthma, that you then um, transition them uh, over to therapy that's more appropriate for COPD uh, than asthma. I would, I mean, there's only so much you can do with these patients. It, it, even in well-funded clinics, like where I practice, the, you know, the, you often had that issue with the, um, you didn't have, you couldn't keep bringing the patient back and trying to convince them to, to stepping up slowly on therapy was the, the best way to go. Um, okay, uh, I'm sorry, any more questions? Uh, yep, just like one more. <laughs> These are great questions, I love them. <laughs> um, so the last one for now is, did you routinely test for AAT deficiency? Uh, no, did not. Um, and um, I know that the, the, there's stuff out there that says that, you know, 1% of patients with COPD have, you know, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And I, I honestly don't believe that's true. I mean, I would, I had a few over the course of my entire practice. Um, the, um, so no, I did not. Uh, if there is a, uh, the ideal uh, setting to do that, obviously would be somebody that has uh, early onset of COPD uh, or they, um, it's said that the with alpha-1 and trypsin, they tend to have a more uh, inverted pattern of uh, emphysematous changes in the lung with the lower parts of the lung being more affected than the upper parts of the lung. So. Oh. Okay, great. That's all for now.
Okay. Um, so anyways, with our, our uh, goals of treatment, um, the, uh, um, we can't really change that uh, downward progression in lung function with our treatments. Um, uh, the most important thing there is going to be um, uh, smoking cessation. Uh, the other things that can uh, prevent, you know, the downward trend is obviously to treat exacerbations and try to, um, uh, you know, reduce pneumonias and things of that nature. But mostly, most of the time, we're just up here. Uh, relieving symptoms. And so that's what our bronchodilators are doing. Um, I can go back over this again, uh, the um, just a refresher, uh, just because this is a little bit complicated. Um, so remember that our treatment groups are based on our symptom scores. So minimal symptoms, um, more moderate daily symptoms. Uh, and exacerbations, one or two, exas one exacerbation or less, hospitalization or multiple exacerbations uh, would be groups C and D. Um, everybody should be, have a short-acting bronchodilator, rescue inhaler, um, but the majority of our treatment is going to be here, uh, either with a single agent, uh, and as I pointed out, um, unless there's reasons otherwise, we we generally will start a llama. Uh, uh, reasons otherwise, for example, somebody's having urinary tract uh, obstructions um, or they, they can't stand the dry mouth associated with this. So in that case, we would switch to um, a lava or use a lava. Um, and then uh, as they uh, are increasingly symptomatic or if this is not controlling their symptoms, then we might switch to combination therapy and then consider introduction of an inhaled corticosteroid if they're the appropriate group. So they've got an elevation in eosinophils, they're not having pneumonia, they don't have atypical mycobacterium. Um, we could uh, try an inhaled corticosteroid in combination with the LABA and LAMA. Just like we do in asthma, um, we review the symptoms they're having, the number of exacerbations. We look at their inhaler technique to make sure it's good. Um, we're trying these uh, other approaches such as pulmonary rehab, uh, make an adjustment uh, or an escalation in therapy if they're still symptomatic. Um, or we de-escalate if they're doing really well and we think we're over-treating them, uh, then it's certainly worth uh, trying them, trying to step down on therapy. Um, excuse me, Dr. Ray. Mm -hmm. So the next question um, is, recognizing that access to specialists varies dramatically, at what point would you ideally want a patient to be referred to a pulmonologist? So um, if they've uh, been hospitalized uh, more than once with COPD, uh, if they're having multiple exacerbations and you don't feel like to have good control of them, uh, if they're to the point that they need oxygen therapy, uh, they need to go on disability. I mean, those are, um, or if there's, uh, if there's, uh, as I'm just about to point out here, if they're having uh, symptoms that just doesn't quite fit together, doesn't make sense that it's just COPD that's causing their symptoms. Uh, might be a good way reason to re refer them, but um, most of the, it's such a chronic disease, and the, our treatments are fairly straightforward, as you can see here, and and limited. Um, even after seeing a pulmonologist, it, I mean, almost all the management is going to occur in your office. Okay, thank you, and then um, one more. Lots of folks are really attached to using their albuterol inhaler and are skeptical uh, of using other inhalers. What's your approach for getting more interest and buy-in from patients to use other inhalers and to leave the albuterol for true exacerbation slash less frequent use? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm taking suggestions that, right, everybody kind of gets a little kick out of using the albuterol. They feel it, it works right away. Um, sure and it's inexpensive and they have it in their pockets. It's so, 
they're constantly um, uh, using it and overusing it. So uh, just, I, I think it's just gonna take a lot of education for our patients that um, they need to be on a long acting in, inhaler, they'll do better on it. Uh, and then um, um, uh, yeah, so I'm just, yeah, I think that's the best thing we can at least try. So anyways, the, uh, you've got somebody with COPD, uh, there's having more trouble, uh, more shortness of breath, cough and congestion. So there is a differential diagnosis. Uh, most of the time, obviously it's gonna be a COPD exacerbation, but uh, we have to be careful that we don't overlook these things, which uh, can produce similar symptoms. So uh, if they you know, are more toxic than they normally are, they, you have localized findings on your exam, um, they may have pneumonia, the, um, uh, you know, sudden shortness about chest pain, um, pneumothorax, uh, more chronic uh, shortness of breath that just is not responding to inhalers and might be a pleural effusion, um, pulmonary embolism, um, and severely dysphagic patients or patients with a localized uh, chest pain that they previously haven't have not had. Um, these patients are all because of their smoking are at risk for heart disease. Um, so heart failure is um, presenting as a COPD exacerbation or sometimes in association with it. Somebody's coming in with uh, severe exacerbation. Uh, oftentimes we'll see an elevation in cardiac enzymes. Uh, and then occasionally even clink, I would run upon a COPD patient that was having more shortness of breath and then and lo and behold, they had a fast irregular pulse and it would be an AFib or flutter. Um, the, um, um, as a uh, explanation for their symptoms. Um, and then, you know, the, I'm sure you, uh, you've had these patients come, come into your office and the next thing you do is you call 911. <laughs> Uh, to get them to the hospital because uh, they look uh, like they're about to go into uh, uh, respiratory distress and or worse. Um, so uh, just in terms of managing exacerbations, um, the, the, this is when you, we will use a lot of sh uh, short-acting bronchodilators, uh, uh, either they're an albuterol inhaler or an albuterol nebulizer. Um, and then oral corticosteroids is really the bedrock of the treatment of these acute exacerbations, a short course, so five, seven days uh, of uh, oral steroids uh, in combination with antibiotics when they've evidence of infection. So what's, what's that? So uh, two out of the three major signs of infection. So they either have uh, a fever, they've got uh, increased sputum production or increased sputum purulence. So any combination of two of those, you know, I would start them on antibiotics um, uh, in addition to their uh, oral steroids. So that was systemic, this is this, systemic steroids can improve FEV1, re uh, shorten recovery time, uh, and they should be short treatments. So that's uh, uh, good evidence. Uh, the antibiotic treatment is, remains, as you, I'm sure you've seen, it's hard, harder to pick out the ones that are gonna to respond to this. So the evidence is less robust, but it's still there. Uh, and so if, if you suspect infection, go ahead and treat them with an antibiotic. And then um, if you want, uh, there's, um, at the end of the slide set, there's a, a little follow-up COPD checklist that kind of goes through everything we talked about um, all on one page um, that you can use to follow your patients. The um, I would love to take any more questions if you have them. Um, the I guess the key things we talked about was um, uh, using spirometry to make a diagnosis, uh, grouping our patients based on their symptoms and their number of exacerbations, and then uh, starting them on uh, long-acting uh, bronchodilator therapy based on that, 
escalating the therapy and using inhaled corticosteroids in our most severe patients if they have elevated eosinophils and they're not having pneumonia or other infections. Um, and then uh, using all your skills to get them to uh, be compliant with your therapies, to use the inhaler correctly, uh, stop smoking, rehab, vaccinations, uh, lungs cancer screening test um, uh, to try to manage uh, this chronic disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. And now at this point, if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand. You can submit them into the chat or into the Q&A box. Give everyone a minute or two to think of some questions. Okay. I know we addressed a lot during the presentation. Um, yeah, no, no, just say, so the, yeah. So each, each patient is different. So there'll be, each patient will have problems that just doesn't quite fit, you know, a, a set of guidelines. So you'll have to, you know, use your best clinical judgment to work through that. Um, so then the, there is one question that came through. Is this check checklist and slide deck going to be available afterwards? And yes, the slide deck will go out to all of the attendees. Okay. And then the next question is, what's the most common mistake or error you see PCPs making? What's the most common? Oh, um, with treatment of COPD is probably, um, it's this question of asthma and COPD, or which is it? Um, and, you know, the, you know, a lot of people don't like to be called COPD. They, you know, it's like they had asthma as a child, you know, they outgrew it, they, but they smoked and they continue to smoke, but they're not heavy smokers. And, you know, it's, you know, but they've been at it for now 20 years and they're having more symptoms, at, you know, to the, and they have obstruction on their spirometry. It's like, you know, do they have COPD? Do they have asthma? Hey, how do we best treat that? Um, and there's not, again, it's more your clinical judgment. If they're, they're behaving more like asthma, they're having these uh, acute flare-ups associated with allergies or an exposure. Um, um, then you may want to treat them more like asthma. Uh, if they don't respond well to bronchodilators, they continue to have symptoms that just are persistent and persistent and, you know, not, not much better with, no matter what you do, then they're probably more like COPD. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I would say, so the, uh, when I would get, some COPD patients that were basically on asthma therapy, they would be on an inhaled corticosteroid alone or an inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist, um, but it really had no significant airway reactivity, just chronic obstruction. They were uh, long-term smokers, then uh, that therapy would need to change. Okay, thank you. And then... Um, what, what's the most common question you get from patients about COPD and when do you re refer to palliative care? Uh, the, um, so the, the most common question is, you know, is there something less expensive uh, that these inhalers are just outrageous, um, and their costs, they put everybody right into the donut hole or, you know, they're, uh, the out-of-pocket expenses are so much, especially for people on uh, low income, that it is just, that, that was the bane of my treatment. It's, I, I knew what to give them, but they couldn't afford it. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't buy it. Uh, you know, um, I found that it, it, extremely difficult. Um, and I don't know a good way around it. Uh, every, every insurance had its own formulary and, um, even with that, it was still expensive medicine. So wanted to, 
to make sure the medicine I was giving the patient was worth, it was, you know, uh, important and valuable enough that they should, um, you know, spend the money to buy it. Uh, but that's, sometimes that's difficult to know, especially when it, you know, if they have COPD, they don't get much symptomatic improvement uh, no matter what you do. So that's hard. Um, what was the other part of that question? I'm sorry, I missed that. So the second part of the question is, when do you refer to palliative care? Oh. Um, so with COPD, the, um, again, again, up to uh, you and the patient to kind of work that out. The, um, we didn't, uh, I mean, there are predictors for mortality based on the number of hospitalizations. So um, a patient uh, that's had three hospitalizations for COPD within a year has a 70% a, a one year mortality, that kind of stuff. But that would be in a, a potentially appropriate patient for um, um, palliative care or hospice. Um, uh, but most of the COPD patients uh, just would go on year after year. You know, they may be in the hospital, out of the hospital, in the intensive care unit, intubated, uh, and then would do okay for the next few years. It's That's a tough one. Uh, uh, kind of a, a corollary to that, um, uh, we used to transplant patients, uh, do lung transplantation patients with COPD, uh, but... Um, it became clear that the transplant patients would die before uh, the a similar group of COPD patients, um, which, you know, in, within five or 10 years, the, the same group of COPD patients that would have qualified for lung transplant were still alive and the transplant patients were dead. Um, these patients tend to outlive what we think they're going to uh, do just they look horrible every time they come in the office. They seem like they're on their last leg, but they keep going. Okay, thank you. And then uh, we still have three minutes, so please feel free to either raise your hand or submit a question into the chat. <laughs> it's back to work for everybody. <laughs> um, there is one more. Uh -huh. oh, just a thank you. They said, thank you so, so much. This was very helpful and validating. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Keep up the good work. As I say, what you guys are doing is amazing. Totally amazing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, last call for any other questions. All right. Well, if not, thank you again so much time for your um, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Ray, and we'll see everyone soon. All right. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.